Batman, The Doom That Came to Gotham is a 2023 animated film. DC has been releasing fairly solid quality animation for the last 15 odd years, beginning with Superman Doomsday. They were largely in a shared continuity, with a few Elseworld titles, which are unique takes on the universe. Previous examples include Gotham by Gaslight or Batman Ninja. Doom is another one of these, taking the traditional Batman characters and transporting them to the late 1920s. Although the film is PG-13, the standard for this line of animated films, it's the closest thing they've come to releasing a straight horror. It's an adaptation of the Lovecraft mythos, complete with body horror, tentacle monsters, and ancient evil. The film is an adaptation of a three-issue comic series from 2000, it is a fairly straight conversion, including frames that are almost visually identical. The comic didn't receive a huge amount of acclaim or attention, so it's nice to see DC take a chance on this adaptation. Generally, the best-received comics have had less than stellar films, like The Killing Joke or Hush, but there are gems in the lesser-known ones. Onto the film itself. It's quite good. Well animated, voice acted, and has a good sense of pace. The redesigns of classic characters are well done, including Poison Ivy, Dr. Freeze, and Lizard. The lore of Batman is all tied into a neat little bundle, which would feel contrived as part of the main continuity, but here it makes for a satisfying one-off film. The horror elements are the most prominent in the finale and the first act, but there are still moments that offer them minor scares. The body count is also higher than expected, including main characters, which is a nice surprise, a leeway granted by the elsewhere in nature. The Lovecraft elements are similarly focused on the beginning and the end, although there are a few references dotted throughout, and it's not exactly unusual for a tentacled monster to stay on the sidelines. There's some strong thematic connection as well, with Batman struggling with the supernatural elements that contrast with his typical secular reality. Of course, being Batman, he is more well equipped to deal with these horrors than a typical protagonist. That's the end of the spoiler-free section. The film begins in the Antarctic, with Bruce Wayne on an expedition with Kylie Kane, Sanjay Todd, and Dick Grayson. Batgirl, Robin, and Nightwing, respectively. They find a ship stuck in the middle of a frozen iceberg. Apparently Oswald Cobblepot, or the Penguin, has gone on an expedition to find something. Now his crew is dead and he is missing. They read his journal, and Batman heads into the freezing cold to find him. He finds the old man, naked and covered in boils, but is unable to catch up with him. Unfortunately, this doesn't really go anywhere, and it seems like he's simply lost to madness, and he never leaves the frozen wasteland. Batman stumbles upon a cave and finds the other survivor of the crew, Grindon, smacking away at ice with a pickaxe. He then reveals that there is a great tentacled beast hiding in the ice, which is later said to be a child of a great old one. In order to avoid madness from staring at its form, Grindon tore out his own eyes, which is a solidly creepy image. Then some Cthulhu penguins appear and attack Batman, who is distracted enough not to notice the tentacle slipping into Grindon's mouth, another bit of body horror. He apparently dies, and they bring the corpse back to Gotham something that Batman has been avoiding for the last 20 years. He gets back to his manor and has a brief discussion with Lucius, who has been running his company while he's been gone. They lightly touch on the racism a black man would face at the time, although this is the only mention of it. Either way, it feels like a bit of spite towards Lovecraft, who is notoriously racist. The Bat family is also more multicultural, which makes sense with their more diverse origins. Unfortunately, the group finds a corpse in the study, Langstrom. He was apparently a bat researcher, as they later discover when they dinner with Oliver Queen, also known as the Green Arrow. Before they depart, however, a mysterious man arrives and offers cryptic clues to Bruce before turning into a demon leaping out the window. The demon is known as Etrigon, and he's actually in a number of animated films, one of the more used side characters, especially in Justice League Dark. Arriving at Queen's house, he seems to be more of a drunken lout than anything, regaling the group with old tales. Harvey Dent briefly shows up, and it's revealed that he's running for mayor. He wins the election, but it's another side plot that doesn't really go anywhere, although Dent has a significant role to play. After dinner, Batman heads out into the night to investigate Langstrom, finding a pentagram and a hidden book inside his old room. Here he learns about the villains of the film, an ancient order called the Cult of Ghoul, dedicated to summoning an eldritch being, and led by Talia al Ghul. Using clues in the book, he tracks down another MacGuffin, and heads off to go find it. Unfortunately, Talia gets there first, and transforms the librarian into a demon, who is able to defeat Batman in combat until Etrigan shows up. Batman manages to escape, finding Talia in the street and encountering Lizard, who has a fairly creepy redesign, with a jaw resembling a bird of prey. They have a brief fight, but Batman is again outmatched and forced to flee. This whole ordeal is his first time being Batman in this continuity, 
so it makes sense he has difficulty dealing with these physically powerful foes. Back at Queen's house, he brings up one of the more major themes of the film, the sins of the father. This theme also came up in the recent live-action film, and many adaptations of the story seem to examine what exactly Thomas Wayne was up to with his extraordinary wealth. While Doom offers her a very different take, there's still a bit of an eat-the-rich attitude, where those with power will do anything to keep it, and doing evil, even for the right reasons, will always end up badly. Batman returns to Wayne Manor, and there's a bit of an oddity with the animation here. It's largely good, but there are occasional moments where the continuity gets a bit confused. It's still supposed to be the same night, but the window is bright as day. There was fog shown before which could explain it, but it still doesn't quite look right. After putting Oliver to sleep, Dick Grayson heads back to the boat they'd come in on, which is also where Grindon was kept. He brings what looks to be a rifle, so in this continuity, the Bat family is not against guns. Unfortunately, Grindon has mutated into Mr. Freeze and has turned all his surroundings into ice, including the unfortunate Sanjay. Lizard then arrives and apparently tears Dick in half, as in a later scene his legs are clearly separated from his arms. So in a brief time, both Robins are killed, a fairly shocking turn of events. Unaware of the happenings, Batman is still trying to make sense of everything. He is trying to combat these seemingly supernatural events with rational explanations. This is a common theme throughout Lovecraft's work, the idea that people are unable to comprehend or acknowledge the things going on around them. It's only after embracing the other side, however, that Batman is truly able to conquer them. For now, he finds the hidden location of the cult and sets out to stop them. Violence is something he can understand. Without much difficulty, he finds the lair and again encounters Lizard. This time, however, he has science and makes up some chlorine bombs that disintegrate him in a fairly gnarly effect, including a bit of flesh melting. It definitely feels like it's pushing the rating, just like Indiana Jones did back in the day. Continuing this theme, after the ritual is completed, serpents pour from desiccated corpses. This causes reptiles to erupt out of all the sewers in Gotham, causing a very biblical plague. Batman then falls into a lake of green liquid, which may be a Lazarus pit, although it's only later that he is reborn from it. The timeline again gets a bit weird as it cuts to the next day, and the newspapers are reporting about the reptiles, and Harvey gives a speech saying he'll get rid of them. Then it cuts to night as Batman emerges out of the sewers. It could have taken him a full day to reach the surface, but it still feels abrupt. He then has a visually impressive vision of the eldritch tentacle beast attacking Gotham. Then everyone just sort of takes a break for a few days as Dent is elected mayor and the plague mysteriously disappeared. It's not entirely clear why, but Talia then murders Mr. Freeze and he coughs up a hairball that becomes Poison Ivy. The whole structure here is a bit odd and although Poison Ivy does have a great bestial form, shown a bit later, for now she's just a random woman. Her entire goal is to touch Harvey Dent, infecting him and turning him into Two-Face, and thereby the door through which their god will arrive. It feels like the middle woman could have been cut out of this, but in order to get more Batman villains, it wasn't. Kane, who had been hanging out with Oliver Queen, then stumbles upon him in full crusader outfit and learns that he's been trying to make up for his mother's misdeeds. His father had made a deal with a demon hundreds of years ago and murdered, stole, and generally did whatever he needed to do in order to keep power. As a consequence of this, he murdered Bruce's parents, a fact that has haunted Oliver for years. So he's gathered up religious artifacts in order to combat the ancient evil. In many ways, he represents the anti-Batman. He embraced spirituality, fights in the light, and confronts his demons. He also did all of this alone, as opposed to the Bat family which Batman used as a support system, and a way to avoid the terrible history in his past. Oliver is forced to deal with these problems, however, as a monstrous poison ivy attacks him, and they have a fight ending with a grenade. Harvey Dent has now been affected by the poison, and visits Dr. Herbert West, a reanimator reference, for help. None is offered, and his transformation accelerates. This is more than a traditional two-face appearance, however, as bulbous growths have overtaken half his body. This is not the final stage of spread, however, which is shown later when he becomes the doorway. In a truly terrifying image, he's still alive, flipping his two-headed coin while the rest of him has grown into a yonic portal, discolored purple flesh clinging to the stone. Before Batman is able to confront him, however, he visits with the Oracle, Barbara Gordon. After an unspecified accident, she has become bound to a wheelchair, but is a powerful psychic. She offers him a chance to speak to his father, a ghost wrapped in flames, as he's been confined to hell due to his actions. It turns out Thomas, Langstrom, Queen, and Cobblepot had all signed their souls to a demon for prosperity and eternal life hundreds of years ago. This is all in the name of bringing Og Sava into reality and destroying it. Batman is then ready, having accepted there is a realm beyond the natural, to face the demons. 
He heads through the portal and has to fight his personal demons, zombie versions of those he's lost, including the two Robins and Green Arrow. He does this with consecrated arrows, again embracing faith over science. He then has a brief battle with Talia, where he eventually stabs her with the final arrow, killing her. He tries to do the same thing on Roz, but he is an eldritch horror rather than a man and claims to be the progenitor of Yibna Roth, Haster, and Cthulhu. Growing to a tentacled beast, he is able to grab Bruce Wayne and strangle him, even kill him. This isn't the end, however, as he finally fully becomes Batman, or Man-Bat, and begins to rip apart the creature over and over. While he kills the little beastie, the large one still emerges, threatening to destroy everything. Here though, the demon Etrigan is again summoned, and using Hellfire is able to destroy the portal, and most of Gotham, as fire licks throughout the entire city. And that's basically it. There's a bit of denouement, and Batman is still alive in his bestial form, ready to fight crime as a bat. The film is definitely strongest in its opening and final act, with a second act that bounces around a bit too much and actions that don't fully justify themselves. The animation, however, is consistently strong, and the unique monster designs and effects are a real treat, and largely an improvement from the comic. This is a must-watch for any fans of Lovecraft and comics, and recommended for anyone into either. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please like, leave a comment, and subscribe. Thank you.